Yes, I swear, yes, I swear Got new Nikes on my feet And beat out Sassoon in my hair I can sure use a Budweiser Fruit of the loom underwear There is truth in advertising, I swear Why would they lie to me When they love what they sell Plus we all know that the liars Have a special fire in hell On the television, radio, and in the magazine The advertising got to perpetuate The American dream And let it be, let it be Now I know that I don't need to buy Everything to try to sell me But so easily divided Is a fool and his money There is truth in advertising Let it be Why would they lie to me When they love what they sell Plus we all know that the liars Got a special fire in hell On the television, radio And in the magazines The advertising got to let you win Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of Stu Leonard's? A lot of people probably haven't, and that's understandable. It's not like it's a huge chain. Stu Leonard's is a grocery store, primarily in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Originally founded as Clover Farms Dairy in the early 1920s by Charles Leonard, in 1969, Stu Leonard Sr. opened the dairy store in Norwalk as a retail outlet for the family's products. It's a unique store in that it has animatronics throughout, almost like a grocery store Disneyland. So, why am I telling you this? Well, contextual information is important, I think, and it's because what happened to Stu Leonard is pertinent to what happened to Crazy Eddie. You see, in 1993, Stu Leonard Sr. was convicted of having committed tax fraud via an elaborate scheme to divert more than $17.1 million in cash receipts over a 10-year period. This fraud involved a computer program designed to skim sales and was directed by Leonard in partnership with the company's CFO and store manager. The cash was then placed in bundles in Leonard's office fireplace to be later moved offshore or disguised as gifts. Leonard was eventually caught in June 1991 carrying $80,000 cash en route to the Caribbean island of St. Martin. He subsequently pled guilty to the charges and in 93 was sentenced to 52 months in prison, where he ultimately served 44. But I bring all of this up simply for comparison's sake, because if you think this was bad, you haven't heard about Crazy Eddie. Coincidentally enough, both Stu Leonard's and Crazy Eddie featured primarily in the Northeastern United States. Maybe there's just something in the drinking water up there that makes people commit huge cash-based crimes. Regardless, Crazy Eddie was a consumer electronics chain started in 1971 in Brooklyn, New York, by businessmen Eddie and Sam Antar. It rose in popularity primarily due to its prices, but also because of its ad campaign for radio and TV commercials, featuring DJ Jerry Carroll as Crazy Eddie, who admittedly copied most of his shtick from early TV commercial pioneer, used car and electronics salesman Earl Madman Muntz, and appeared in several thousand different ads for the store. But maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves. How did we get here to begin with? I suppose with Eddie Antar, son of Sam Antar. 
Their original store, another consumer electronics shop called Sight and Sound, started in 1969. But thanks to his aggressive sales techniques, Eddie quickly became known as Crazy Eddie. However, within 18 months, the shop, as well as Eddie and his cousin Ronnie, were nearly bankrupt. Instead of failing outright, Eddie bought out Ronnie's one-third ownership stake of Sight and Sound, while Sam retained his one-third stake. In 1971, Sight and Sound was officially renamed Crazy Eddie, and this time, they were wildly successful. By 1977, five Crazy Eddie stores were in operation, and by 1981, Crazy Eddie... Nope. <laughs> by 1977, five Crazy Eddie stores were in operation, and by 1981, Crazy Eddie was operating 10 locations in total. To go from nearly bankrupt to running 10 different stores, now, that's nothing short of a success story. But to be fair, a lot of that was in part thanks to their advertising campaign, which is where we meet Jerry Carroll. Jerry Carroll was a radio disc jockey known as Dr. Jerry at WPIX FM. In 1972, Antar had paid for an on-air ad, and Carol read the chain's slogan, His prices are insane! in an exaggerated, frenetic manner. When Antar heard this delivery, he phoned the station and told Carol to say the line the exact same way every single time. Thus began the birth of Crazy Eddie. The weird thing here, however, is the disconnect. Because, well, there was a Crazy Eddie. That's Eddie Antar. Yet the crazy Eddie that people know is the pitch man in the advertising. In fact, during the 1980s, there were more than 7,500 unique radio and television ads broadcast in the tri-state area. And his acting became so identified with the company that many people thought he was Crazy Eddie. This disconnect isn't very unusual for what it's worth. For example, Dave Thomas of Wendy's fame. Dave Thomas is the founder of Wendy's, but the mascot, Wendy, modeled after his own daughter, Melinda Lou Wendy Thomas, is the far more recognizable and identifiable of the two, despite Dave Thomas having starred in more than 800 commercials for the chain while he was alive. Wendy's, perhaps, is a generational disconnect more than anything else, with people from a certain point in time remembering Thomas more so than Wendy herself. And it makes sense considering Wendy is just a figurehead and has never been given a proper mascot function outside of iconography. Regardless, this isn't really anything of note, it's just an interesting little detail. In 1975, Carol began appearing in television commercials for Crazy Eddie, and for the next 15 years he performed commercials in the same frenetic manner that he had for radio. He also had a trademark look, something most mascots need, wearing a blue suit with a lighter blue turtleneck. To say the advertising campaign was a success is lowballing it. The commercials were so memorable that HBO's news parody series called Not Necessarily the News created a caricature of Oliver North known as Crazy Ollie, selling used weapons at bargain prices. Another parody appeared on NBC's Saturday Night Live in 1977, with Dan Aykroyd performing as Crazy Ernie. His presence was so famous, so ubiquitous, that the makers of Yo Play Yogurt even signed him to do a commercial for their product in 1985. The man was as much an advertising mainstay as anyone else, one could argue. The references don't stop there either. A store bearing the name appears briefly in the X-Men 97 animated series, while a store employee appears in season two of the Netflix series Russian Doll. Futurama's Insane in the Mainframe episode references the character, reimagining him as a robot named Malfunctioning Eddie. And in perhaps the strangest yet somehow most seemingly understandable place for him to be referenced, the 1986 animated film The Brave Little Toaster has its own character, once again named Crazy Ernie, who has a somewhat significant role in the plot. 
Keep in mind too that aside from that last one, most of these are made well after the character was retired and the campaign had ended, once again indicating just how major an impact his presence had made on folks in its time. Which is kind of what makes this story so sad, really, because for once, it wasn't the mascot that had the bad reputation or the downfall. It was the company itself and the man who ran it. They just happened to share the same name. Crazy Eddie and his performer Jerry Carroll were essentially a pawn. I was 14 years old, I, I started working for Crazy Eddie. That's the same Crazy Eddie who committed one of the most outrageous financial statement frauds in history. Eddie Antar, the president, CEO, and major shareholder of the company, uh, was convicted of uh, like 17 counts of fraud. What happened was, it was it, the case was overturned on the technicality. Eventually, he pled guilty and is serving about eight years in prison. And there's a saying that you can do more with a pencil than with a gun, and in some aspects, it's true. And I think in this aspect, it's true. Over 400, 500 million dollars worth of investors' money, and God knows how much, how many lives have been shattered by this. So there's a lot of bad things that were done. I knew the consequences of what I was doing, and I, I, I knew that I was hurting people, and a lot of people got hurt by it. We were a bait and switch company. That's why it's called Crazy Eddie, the advertisements. It's all in the name. Crazy Eddie's used to advertise. Get your best price and then come into Crazy Eddie, we'll beat it. What does that tell you? You gotta come and haggle to get the price. We're not honest, we can't give you the right price right away. I mean, uh, Eddie was the tough guy that everybody looked to if there was a problem. It was a problem that he was there. He was a muscular guy, he was a good looking guy, a very charismatic kind of a guy. Uh, I was very friendly with Eddie and Eddie's brother Mitchell. I was very friendly as Eddie. Eddie was like a godlike figure to me even before I went to Crazy Eddie's. What was born as a family conspiracy to skim money and evade taxes grew to a financial fraud of huge proportions and it ended with victims everywhere. See, the chain's success wasn't because they were good at what they did, necessarily. It was because, almost from the beginning, the management engaged in various forms of fraud. They deliberately falsified their books to either reduce or eliminate their taxable income, even regularly skimming thousands of dollars in cash earned at shops. In 1979, they began depositing much of this money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, in Israeli bank accounts, skimming an estimated three to four million per year at the height of their fraud. In one offshore account in particular, it was discovered that they had deposited more than six million dollars between 1980 and 1983. Suddenly, Stu Leonard's fraudulent business practices pale in comparison, doesn't it? By 83, however, it was becoming harder to hide the millions of illicit income, and so Eddie himself hatched a plan. Take the company public. In preparation, Eddie initiated a scheme in 79 to skim less each year, and since more income was actually being reported, this had the effect of showing drastically increasing profit margins, meant to be very enticing to those interested in stock. And it worked like a charm because its initial public offering in September 84 saw shares being sold initially for $8 a piece, and by 86, the stock was trading at more than $75 a share. For the fiscal year of 85, Crazy Eddie falsified inventories by $3 million. The next fiscal year, 10 to $12 million. But it couldn't last. Not only did their share begin to drop rapidly, but by 87, the stock cost less than $10 a piece. But the public perception of Crazy Eddie began to change as well. In May of 87, Eddie began proceedings to make the company privately held again. But as this happened, another electronics discounter, Elias Zinn, partnered with management consultant Victor Palmieri to purchase $17.5 million of Crazy Eddie stock. This resulted in them having controlling interest in the company, then enabling a hostile takeover. This was really the end because once rumors of a takeover started, financial analysts began to examine more closely the company's financial situation. 
And what they discovered was that while most stockholders had lost money since 1984, Eddie himself had sold 6.5 million shares worth $74 million. And almost immediately, a flurry of lawsuits from stockholders were filed against the family. In March 89, the company shuttered 17 of its 43 stores. And then on June 6th, Crazy Eddie was served a petition by five of its creditors, who had not been paid the $860,000 they were owed. Unsurprisingly, 15 days later, the chain voluntarily filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. This didn't really help, however, because in October 89, this bankruptcy was converted from Chapter 11 to Chapter 7, and the company began a total liquidation. By the end of November 89, the last 18 stores they had in operation shuttered, and the chain, which only five years earlier had been one of the more lucrative retail chains in the U.S., ceased to exist entirely. The SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, charged Eddie Antar with fraud and illegal insider trading in September 89. He was also ordered to appear in court to explain what had happened with the money, but he failed to materialize, causing an arrest warrant to be issued. Eddie did, however, surrender to U.S. Marshals a week later, but when he failed to appear at a second hearing, another warrant was issued and his assets were frozen. Turns out, Eddie fled to Israel using a fake passport, and it makes sense considering they had primarily used Israeli banks. However, this didn't really solve anything. He was arrested again June 92 on federal racketeering conspiracy charges and extradited to the U.S. in January 93. On July 20th, Eddie was found guilty of 17 counts of fraud and sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison. One of the prosecutors, Michael Chertoff, called Eddie the Darth Vader of capitalism. Eddie eventually pleaded guilty to federal charges in May 96, and February 97 was once again sentenced to eight years in prison. He was also ordered to pay more than $150 million in fines, in addition to the more than $1 billion in judgments against him resulting from various civil suits. Despite efforts to revive the company at later dates, mostly as an online retailer, these never panned out, and in 2004, the trademark and any associated intellectual property were acquired by the Texas-based company Trident Growth Fund. In 2006, Trident then attempted to auction the brand and domain name on <laughs> eBay of all places, but its reserve price was not met. This is maybe the saddest ending for an intellectual property I've ever heard of. The name had been so besmirched by Eddie's actions, and the actions of those around him, that not only was it available for sale on eBay, but nobody fucking wanted it. As of 2018, the trademark is listed as abandoned. Carol died in October of 2020, four years after Eddie. However, and this is notable, I feel, his death was not publicized, despite how famous the mascot had been while performing in the ad campaign throughout those years. Perhaps, if anything, not acknowledging his demise was a small way for Carol to alleviate himself of any sort of association with a company that had, essentially, used him as a mouthpiece to gain business for their fraud. I know if I were him, I'd be particularly pissed. Crazy Eddie is one of the stranger mascots we've covered, partially because, despite his fame and recognition amongst the public as the pitchman for the company, he wasn't ultimately the one with the story. And if anything, the man who bore the character's namesake is the villain here, while the mascot is nothing more than a victim. But from where I sit, as a purveyor of mascot history, an archivist of sorts if you will, I think the character is the one who deserves to be remembered far more than the man he was named after. One just wanted to hawk us cheap electronics through a goofy performance, and the other stole upwards of a billion dollars. 
In hindsight, perhaps Stu Leonard's fraud wasn't really as bad as it appeared, especially when compared to what Eddie Antar did. I guess, however, at least his name was on point, because what he did was pretty goddamn crazy. Silly Sam stereo prices are guaranteed lowest. Wacky Wally's lowest Christmas sale prices ever. Well, forget the imitators and come see the originator, Crazy Eddie. There's no Santa Claus like Crazy Eddie because along with guaranteeing the lowest sale prices, we'll give you $100 if we don't immediately beat any legitimate advertised price. You heard right. Crazy Eddie will give you $100 if we can't beat any price you can find. Crazy Eddie will never be undersold. <laughs> 